Benny Goodman made his first radio broadcast in 1935, he couldn't possibly have known that his music would change America and later the world forever. And he could never have imagined, with his bank manager looks, that he'd become one of the world's first global pop stars. And the music was called Swing. Everything in life got a beat, and that was, that's what Swing was. The riff starts, you can see the audience, they're lighting up, and by the end of it, they're standing up and dancing, and the, it's the physical effect that it has on people. That's why the swing of music is great. Decades before the 60s, it sparked the world's first youth cultural revolution. That was what the whole swing era was about, was the dancing. I mean, without dancing, there would have been no swing era. Swing was labeled as dangerous music that made you have sex with people. Swing has thrown up some of the most iconic stars of the 20th century. Today, it's still topping the charts with some of the biggest names in music. Robbie Williams' Swing album went platinum seven times over. Nearly a hundred years on, Swing remains the longest lived, most successful and coolest form of popular music. Of course, one never snaps one's fingers on the beat. It's considered aggressive. You don't push it, you just let it fall. Like this. And of course, if uh, you're real cool, then you're gonna manage to affect a tilt of the left earlobe at the same time, like this, you know? And if you're cooler than that, then of course, you tilt the left earlobe on the beat and snap the finger on the afterbeat like this, you know? As a matter of fact, by routining the tilting of the airlobe and snapping the finger, one can become as cool as one wishes to be. We took a poll on the campus and almost everybody voted for Artie Shaw's band. Artie Shaw? Who's Artie Shaw? Yeah. Yeah. At its most basic, swing is a mixture of orchestrated big band music and improvised jazz. In the 1930s, it turned band leaders like Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller and Artie Shaw into pop music's first superstars. They earned as much as $60,000 a week, roughly half a million pounds in today's money. Much of the credit for this goes to band leader Benny Goodman, who, in 1935, almost single-handedly, turned swing into a global pop phenomenon. The real credit for its creation, however, belongs elsewhere and in an earlier time. The story of swing is partly about poverty, crime and sex, but chiefly, it's about race, and it starts in New York in the 1920s, where the music scene was as segregated as America. Slavery had been abolished, but its legacy was a country divided along the lines of race which meant that in much of America, African Americans could not drink at the same water fountains, eat at the same restaurants, or sit next to white people on the same bus. Black and white had died together in the First World War, but in post-war America, they lived separate lives and listened to different music. White music had developed from foxtrots and polkas, black music from Africa and the jazz of New Orleans. But in the lean years following the First World War, what both audiences had in common was a thirst for fun, and that meant dancing. King of the white dance bands was Paul Whiteman. Paul Whiteman became the band leader elect of the 1920s. Everything else was a smaller group. They were more like Dixieland groups, but they weren't as organized. Paul Whiteman started, in my way of thinking, uh, the organized type of uh, uh, band. He had people like Big Spiderbeck in the band that he, that he featured. He had Bing Crosby. Paul Whiteman was at the beginning of it all. 
I'm a sentimental sap, that's all. What's the use of trying not to fall? I have no will. Are you made your kill? Cause you took advantage of me. Paul Whiteman's smooth big band was perfect hotel music for a generation that wanted to dance the Charleston and forget the horrors of the First World War. It had elements of jazz, but drew heavily on classical music. The classically trained George Gershwin was one of Whiteman's chief collaborators. In 1924, Whiteman commissioned Gershwin to write Rhapsody in Blue, one of the first pieces of symphonic jazz. It has become a staple in the repertoire of classical music. It was a style of music that would influence classical composers from Aaron Copland to Leonard Bernstein. What this well-organized big band music did not have was any of jazz's wild sounds or improvisation. For that, you had to turn to a black tradition of music, the jazz of New Orleans and Chicago. Its greatest exponent, one of the most influential musicians of all time, was Louis Armstrong. And it was he, more than anyone else, who provided the inspiration for swing. And we're gonna swing for you. In 1923, Paul Whiteman was amongst the many New York musicians who flocked to hear him play in Joe King Oliver's band. And I look around, Joe Allo and myself was playing duets, and all the musicians, Bix and all them boys used to come by, Paul Whiteman said, I let listen to us play, and they didn't know how we did it, you know. I, I, not so much of him until I had notes, second trumpet notes to it, all the riffs and the, all them breaks he used to make. It breaks you here now. They were originated by Joe, and, and I had a note for every one of them, and they thought that was marvelous. Couldn't nobody trick us. <laughs> Armstrong's familiar showbiz personality makes it easy to forget that he was one of the greatest trumpet players the world has ever seen. Jazz starts with the rhythm. The melody is very crucial, the harmony is crucial, but I'm a rhythm guy. I like, I like that groove, you know, it's tap your foot. If you can't tap your foot, Duke Ellington say, don't mean a thing if it doesn't have that swing. Louis Armstrong was about swinging. Armstrong was known as Pops and he was the father of jazz, a master of one of the vital components that would come to define swing, improvisation. He's the greatest. I'm so happy to have been on the scene uh, with him, and become a good friend of his. He and I and Dizzy used to live in the next, in the same neighborhood, rather. And uh, occasionally, Dizzy and I would call each other up and say, let's go bug Pops. So we'd walk up to Pops' house and ring the bell, and Lou would say, who is it? She said, it looks like Diz and Clark. He said, let her in, let her in, let my man. So we'd go in and uh, he'd say, sit down, I'm going to give you the history of jazz. <laughs> and he was, of course, the history of jazz. Armstrong was the very definition of a virtuoso. He could spontaneously invent new melodies as he played. The 
that was the idea of improvisation, where, as we, the kids say, you do your own thing. Well, yes, there was this freedom to express yourself. And this was pure joy, because as we all know, when we can do that, whether speaking or singing or playing or whatever, we feel good about it when we can tell our story. And if you can tell it musically or otherwise, that's a good thing. And Louis Armstrong was the first great jazz improviser. He set the mold for every, everyone to come after him. Growing up in Jamaica, me hearing that feeling in the music ended up being called swing. There was a pulse in the rhythm, and it was, I, I knew from a very early age that it was all this New Orleans influence. And I think what New Orleans was was a real melting pot cauldron of all these peoples coming from various places. When you said New Orleans, right away, it stood for the groove. Armstrong was raised in New Orleans, where music was a fundamental part of the city's way of life. New Orleans produced some of the greatest improvisers of the age. sing because they can't vote. People play instruments because they don't have political power or social mobility. People sing or play instruments because they don't have economic opportunities. People sing or play music because they don't have a system of justice that is uh, equal to what was going on in terms of citizenship or whatnot. So music played a very practical and functional role. It was the primary, if you will, uh, method and means of expression and communication for a people who felt ostracized and disenfranchised. Young Louis Armstrong grew up expecting local musicians to be playing at nearly all important events, birth, marriage and death. Jazz is still the order of the day at funerals in New Orleans, happy on the way back from the funeral and sad on the way there. Some of the greatest names in jazz, such as Jelly Roll Morton, started their careers as jobbing musicians at the home of the recently deceased. Of course now when the dead man would be there, he wouldn't hear anything that we would be saying at all, nothing. And of course we'd all go right on back to the kitchen and get our cheese sandwiches, ham sandwiches, all slapping over with mustard and some whiskey and cans of beer sometimes. And sometimes, if it was a man dead, a lot of times the lady would be glad, that, you know, the wife to the husband would be glad that he's gone. And she would, of course, she'd be having a wonderful time also. But the magnet for many of the city's greatest musicians was the prospect of work in Storyville. This was New Orleans' officially licensed red light district, and there was plenty of jobs for musicians to play in the lobbies of brothels and drinking dens. It was where a very young Louis Armstrong found work, delivering coal in an area that was usually off limits. I, I used to hear all that good music too, and they didn't run me out of it, just because I was working for white man. I didn't have no problem at all. I could hear the best music there was down there. All your best musicians. Like many of the greatest jazz musicians, Armstrong had extraordinarily wide-ranging taste in music throughout his life. Growing up in New Orleans, he was soaked in church music, ragtime and the blues, as well as pop tunes. His technical brilliance allowed him to absorb all of it at his own feel and turn it into a brand new music.
Armstrong decided and got capable of improvising, then everything changed. He was so relaxed and so flexible and so elastic and so swinging, you know. But that also made it very attractive to outsiders who listened to it and who watched it because they were attracted to this freedom of improvisation, this joy that was being expressed by these people. In 1924, Armstrong's New Orleans sound was about to change the course of 20th century popular music. This was the year he teamed up with an African-American big band leader from New York who, like so many, was mesmerized by Armstrong's talent. His name was Fletcher Henderson. In New York City, it was either you either think about Paul Whiteman or you think about Fletcher Henderson. Like the other New York musicians, Henderson was blown away by what Armstrong had done with the jazz of New Orleans, and the fusion of the two would create what we now know as swing. When Fletcher Henderson first heard Armstrong, he told everybody that he had heard this guy who could really swing. And as far as we know, that's the first time that phrase was, or that term was used to describe a certain way of playing the rhythm. And so it really originates with Armstrong. Fletcher Henderson had seen the future, and in 1924, he persuaded Armstrong to come to New York and join his band. So when he comes to play with Fletcher Henderson's band, this is like the hottest band in New York. So this country boy walks in, you know, they don't think much of him. But once he started playing, though, they, then they knew what the deal was. They knew he could do something they couldn't do. actually say, I think with, with no exaggeration, that the swing era starts when Louis Armstrong plays with Fletcher Henderson. Now, jazz was a music that was not written. They played it, but they didn't write it. Fletcher Henderson began putting those notes down on paper, and out of that came the great swing band. Henderson had been taking a master's degree in chemistry when he realized America had no place for a black scientist. He switched to band leading and relied heavily on Don Redman, his saxophone player, the son of a music teacher, to write arrangements incorporating Armstrong's virtuosity and improvisation into the big band sound. Fletcher Henderson started out uh, accompanying blues singers and uh, had his own band, but it wasn't until the arrival of Louis Armstrong that actually gave a kick to Fletcher's band. It really gave uh, uh, Henderson a vehicle to base arrangements around. And this is what we, you know, begin to talk about the development of a swing formula, the way of arranging the big band to keep this sound moving that makes people want to dance. You can have one section playing a melody and the rest of the sections backing them up with these little rips or these little shouts, if you will. And then who plays the melody changes. And who plays the shouts changes. So you have this unique dynamic that is new. 
when they, when you hear the earlier jazz recordings, there's it's a lot more improvisational. Once the once you start once they started writing the things out, of course, it's 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 you're getting two halves of stuff. You're getting part, part of the people playing the written part, and then somebody improvising over the top. Music is one of the few art forms where you where the fact that you're focusing on two or three things happening at once is what gives you the the vibration that is really great and with the big band is the most is the most perfect vehicle for that so if somebody has written out sort of a big a big riff going well i can't play on the piano because i've got enough hands but if somebody's got uh you know the rhythm section keeping the keeping the and then and then and then the sort of saxophones are, or whatever it is they're playing and then somebody on the top on a clarinet or whatever is going there and so you're getting this, you're, but you can, when you hear all the three things at once, then that's when the whole thing works. When Fletcher Henderson unleashed swing in New York in 1924, it was at just the right time and in just the right place. It became the soundtrack for one of the greatest explosions of African-American culture the world had ever seen. George Gershwin, Irving Berlin, and Jerome Kern may have been the kings of popular music of the time, but in the New York district of Harlem, everyone was listening to swing, and it was helping to turn the area into the black cultural capital of the world. Since the beginning of the century, an emerging black middle class had colonized Harlem and turned it into a haven for the many escaping rural depression and racism. Harlem was the one place black people could come to and be free. No place else. That's why people came. They came from the South, they came from the West, they can, they can walk, they can ride, whatever way they got to Harlem because it was there. Whatever they wanted to do, that was the best place that they could do it was in Harlem and there was nothing to stop them from doing it. So that became a magnet. With the arrival of intellectuals and writers like Langston Hughes and Marcus Garvey, 20s Harlem experienced what was known as the Harlem Renaissance. For the first time, the world became aware of African-American culture. Josephine Baker rocked Paris, and a Harlem review called Blackbirds was a huge hit in 20s London. Everybody came to Harlem, everybody, poets, singers, writers, they were all condensed in this one small area. So here you had the most talented, most brilliant-minded people who had no freedom. Here was a place you could write your books, you could produce your great Cat Calloways and Bill Robinson, and uh, every place was a rehearsal hall. That's all I used to do on Saturday was go from one rehearsal hall to the other because uh, I just wanted to be, I wanted to be one of them. Into this artistic melting pot stepped arguably the greatest American composer of the 20th century. And he took swing to a whole new level. Kennedy Ellington's natural grace had earned him the nickname Duke at the age of seven. He was born into a middle-class household in Washington, D.C. and moved to New York in 1923 when he heard Fletcher Henderson's band, with its complex interplay between instruments, he knew that swing was the perfect new framework for his own refined style of music.
thing that made Duke Ellington unique was that he really discovered how to blend the refined and the raw perfectly. It was a devastating combination. By the late 20s, swing was by far the dominant form of jazz. Ellington and the rest of them were really taking over. A jazz band that was a swing band, it was a dance band, it wasn't pure jazz. And a lot of uh, the early jazz fans were very well aware of this. And they said, this stuff that's being played by Ellington or Henderson is not the true jazz. The true jazz is the New Orleans jazz. It didn't matter. The New Orleans jazz was dead. And whatever kind of jazz you're going to have was going to be played in the context of a big dance band. Sometimes uh, a tune just comes into you, knocks you down. Yeah. You can't resist it, and you just have to put it down. And usually, it associates someone, some itself, with some specific performer in the band. Any 18-piece orchestra, 15, 18-piece orchestra, and line them up and have them to play one of Ellington's charts and then have Ellington's band play it, and it, it wouldn't swing as much because Duke knew how to use the people that he, he had in his band. Some members of Ellington's band stayed with him for 45 years. What is the secret of keeping a band together for as long as you do? Because well, you've got to have a, a gimmick, uh, Humphrey. And it's a, it's a, the one I use. I mean, I use a gimmick. Huh? Yeah. Just give them money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can see that's very popular. <laughs> because he had the same people in the group for, for such a long, for, for a long time, that meant that you got this, not only a consistency of sound, but in the end, the thing that I've, I'm starting to achieve with my band, although my big band has been, I suppose, going for maybe uh, 15 years, 10, 15 years, is they start thinking as one, and so you don't no longer have to explain things. Some things you write an arrangement out, other things you just start playing and people find parts that are actually better than the ones you write out, because they, the, the band thinks as one. And not only could his band, if they wanted to, they could play the blues and swing like straight away if they wanted to, but they could go off in all sorts of other tangents. But it always had what the Ellingtonian thing was. You could always tell it was him. Many of the techniques Ellington expected of his band had previously been the preserve of classical musicians. Circular breathing, for example, a fiendishly difficult technique that allowed brass players in his band to sustain a note indefinitely. You take an intake of air through your, through your nostril, and while you're breathing that air th through your nostril into your lungs, your jaws are filled with air. You push the jaws like that, so it's like... And, if you, and at the same time, you have to realize, I haven't played in a couple of days, so I don't have any, any ambition, but you have to buzz.
from so as long as you can keep a buzz and keep your chops a buzzer like that, you can go on forever. It was Duke Ellington who first noticed that swing was a bit more than just a form of music. It don't mean a thing, all you gotta do is swing. Swing was the music of black self-expression. But most importantly of all, it was dance music. And on the dance floor, anyone was free to get up and let themselves go. If you ain't got that swing You're dancing to the beat And that's what it was It was the beat And uh, everything in life Got a beat And that was, that's what swing was I mean, you couldn't listen to the music And not dance to it Throughout the 1920s, dance had remained one of the key forms of entertainment for black and white audiences in America. Crazies had come and gone, but the most popular dance of the decade had been the Charleston. Young white college students had scandalized their elders by wildly jigging about or flapping. This dance was taken by African-American audiences and adapted to suit their music swing. The resulting dance, the Lindy Hop, was a careful combination of the organized and the improvised. The most famous dance troupe of the day was Whitey's Lindy Hoppers, and Norma Miller, born in 1919, was one of its key members. They were the resident dancers at the Temple of Swing Dancing, the Savoy Ballroom in Harlem. Dark Harlem's hot and noisy Savoy. Well, I was 12. I wasn't supposed to be there, but I got in there because of Twist My George. That was Easter Sunday, and uh, they had a matinee, and. You know, and you left church and you went up to Harlem because you wanted to see the Easter parade. And that was a time coming out the winter coats and things and you saw clothes that you couldn't believe. And this was an Easter Sunday and I was standing outside with some boy because I wanted to see the people going in. They were dressed up and this man called me and wanted, and wanted me to, you know, when the music started playing, I was out there dancing in the street like all kids. And he asked me to come up and dance with him at the Savoy Ballroom. Well, this is what we did seven days a week. We had to learn a routine. We were trained like athletes. I mean, this was every day, rehearsing, rehearsing, till we became the best in the world. We were just the best. Your life began with swing. For large swathes of America, however, the open exuberance of swing dancing confirmed their opinion that this latest form of jazz was a threat to the nation's morals. Worse still, it thrived in the illegal drinking clubs or speakeasies that flourished in the Prohibition era. The speakeasies did a land office business. Texas Guinan with her gals kept customers roaring. Duke Ellington was the star turn at Harlem's legendary Cotton Club, a few hundred yards from the Savoy Ballroom. The Cotton Club was owned by British-born gangster Oni Madden, one of New York's most influential and violent citizens. Jazz has always originated in places that allowed it to nurture. Like, in, it was always in either uh, in whorehouses nightclubs that had a lot of drinking, had a lot of dancing, but most of all, places that were run by the rackets, gangsters, basically. And they loved jazz musicians because it was happy music that made people feel good. And for some reason, I never knew any jazz musicians that worked in those places that had any trouble with the gangsters at all.
We were in the Cotton Club for five years. Mm. We had a wonderful spot. It was owned by people who uh, were very influential and uh, prestigious with having things accomplished. And um, the, the great thing was about it that when the show on, and they did have a wonderful show, no one was allowed to talk. And uh, some guy would start talking, rap, 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 rap. And the waiter would come over, sir, would you please? And then the next thing, he'd go on, and the next thing, the captain would come over, and, say, and the next thing, you know, the head waiter would come, and, say, and then the next thing, the guy would just disappear. <laughs> <laughs> That, of course, was the, 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 in, be in the, what, the Prohibition era, wouldn't it? Yes. By that time, yeah. Did you have any trouble with federal, federal agents or anything like that? You know? Federal agents? Yeah. No. No, I didn't. I, uh, there was never another, another, anything left for them to confiscate. <laughs> <laughs> the Savoy, Oney Madden's Cotton Club was exclusively for rich white New Yorkers. That was right up the street, but you can go into, you can work the Cotton Club, you couldn't go in the Cotton Club. But I never went in the Cotton Club anyway. I, I, I couldn't even afford to go to the Cotton Club. But they had black shows, but white audiences. As a matter of fact, white people took over Harlem at nighttime in, in, in when I was coming up. I guess when I was about 13 years old, I became aware of jazz on a Duke Ellington record. Uh, I let a song go out of my heart. And of course, it was the first time I really heard jazz. Of course, in my house, my mother was an opera lover, concert goer, chamber music person. And the nearest I ever got to jazz was a George Gershwin on our pianola music role. I guess that's what started it. And from there on in, man, I couldn't get enough of it. Duke Ellington may have been playing in a segregated club, but he wrote a series of pieces that captured the mood of black America as the high hopes of the Harlem Renaissance floundered on the realities of prejudice and economic hardship. Duke had first-hand experience of how America could treat some of its greatest musicians. In 1931, he was on the radio in Chicago, but the show wasn't broadcast nationally. Advertisers didn't want to be linked to a black performer. He was at a dinner and it was segregated and he got invited to the white table and Duke said, well, I'm not going unless the entire orchestra goes over there. And so they went back and they, uh, they asked the people hosting the party if that would be okay. And they said, no, but you should come over anyways. And then my grandfather took exception and left with the entire orchestra. Racism wasn't the only problem Ellington and the other bands faced. The stock market crash of 1929 started the Great American Depression of the 30s. Only the biggest crowd-pleasing bands could survive, providing a jolly antidote to the economic reality. And then there was an error on the part of show business managers. They thought jazz was dead. That was something that had happened in the 20s. It was finished. It was over. It was a fad. Forget about it. What people want is nice dreamy and, and a very slow dancing and this kind of thing. Uh, and they were wrong. Easy listening big bands seemed to be taking over, 
and by the early 30s, Fletcher Henderson was on his uppers. Desperate for money, he started selling his precious arrangements. He sold some to a brilliant young clarinetist. His name was Benny Goodman. He swung on his clarinet, whether he had a band behind him or a small group behind him, he was just a swinger. I think he was uh, a natural virtuoso. He wasn't an original, he didn't have uh, an original style except one which he created from the hybridness he took from, the, uh, from several other clarinet players, but he was clever enough to do that and make it individual and he, he could do anything. I, I still get astounded half a century or more later, some tracks that I'd never heard of Benny Goodman, where he hits on a new idea that I'd never heard before, and he probably never used again after that record session, but he could just do anything he wanted. By the time Benny Goodman arrived, Swing was 10 years old and had already spawned some of America's greatest musicians, but it was yet to be embraced by mainstream America. Benny Goodman changed all that. In terms of success, he was about to become the Elvis Presley of swing. Goodman was heavily indebted to Fletcher Henderson's arrangements. Benny Goodman could have never had the sound he had without Fletcher Henderson. So we're talking about a man of color who wrote for Benny Goodman. When he did the King Porter Stump, it was Fletcher Henderson who wrote that arrangement. So it might have been played by white musicians, honey, but they were getting their soul and their spirit from Fletcher Henderson, because he was something else. He was a real swinger. In Goodman's hands, swing would go mainstream and become the soundtrack for the first sighting of the American teenager, a full 20 years before the arrival of rock and roll. Adults were baffled. Swing, swing. What does the dictionary say about rhythm? <laughs> As we feared, a measured beat. Let's measure it with our special camera. The exposure is made with a spark. Benny Goodman was one of 12 children born into a poverty-stricken Chicago family. Like many Jewish musicians, he saw jazz as a way in to mainstream American culture and a way of making a living. By the age of 16, he was working professionally in white big bands. Later, when he moved to New York, he spent a lot of time in Harlem and became one of the first white band leaders to play alongside African-American musicians. If Benny wished for anything, he'd be wished to be colored, because he used to spend all this time in Harlem. And when he heard Teddy Wilson, he flipped out. When he heard Lionel Hampton, he hired him immediately. Jazz brought the races together. And that's, where, that's how Benny Goodman had the first black musicians in his band. And that's how, and it just went on from there. Other black musicians, that's how it broke out of that mold. Black musicians couldn't go in the hotels. White musicians couldn't play jazz without a black man sitting beside him. It was simple as that. When you listen to them, you actually get the impression, or I got the impression when I first heard them, that this is a black guy on the clarinet playing with some white guys on these other instruments. <laughs> Goodman might have been colorblind, but America was not. Racial prejudice had stopped Duke Ellington's radio show being transmitted across the country. 
For a white band leader like Goodman, however, there was no such restrictions, and in 1934, his breakthrough came on a radio show. By this time, many dance halls had been brought to their knees by the Depression, and radio had begun to fill the gap for dance music. Goodman landed a spot on NBC's nationally broadcast music show, Let's Dance. A program called Let's Dance, where he was the orchestra selected for the jazz part. The producers of that show realized that the collapse of the ballroom business and the death of the bands of the 20s was largely an economic thing. The people still wanted to have a dance on Saturday night. They just didn't have a place to go or money to pay for the entry. And the places had folded because nobody was going. So they gave him a Saturday night dance on the radio. Somebody could put a radio out and they would have their own little homebrew dance. And the show clicked. It was very popular. When Goodman's radio show led to a national tour, Middle America, it was felt, wasn't ready for a mixed-race big band, so the big band he took on the road was all white. He loved playing with black musicians, but he was very conservative. He came from a very poor family, and they worried about getting some, anything to eat, let alone getting enough to eat. And. Uh, Pe Benny was the first one to be able to make any money, and he wasn't about to jeopardize that because he was uh, supporting the whole family. I mean, he loved playing with the black musicians, but he was afraid that he just wouldn't be accepted, and as it was, he couldn't play in the South with them. In the spring of 1935, Benny Goodman's all-white big band set out on the tour that would change the history of popular music forever, but it all started very badly. It wasn't genteel enough for some of these, these people, and they couldn't stand it because he was too loud. And they got to Denver, and the only people in the audience were friends of the musicians, and Benny was ready to turn back and give up the band-leading business but his musicians talked him into continuing the tour and they made it out to Los Angeles. I think August 21st, 1935, is uh, widely held to be the inauguration of the swing era. That was the day Benny Goodman turned up at the Palomar Ballroom. The Palomar Ballroom called itself the largest and most famous dance hall on the West Coast. Its dance floor could accommodate 4,000 couples. After his dismal tour, Goodman was sure most of it would be empty. An estimated 10,000 people showed up to hear the Goodman Band. It, apparently, his, uh, his nationwide radio show had been airing in California and people had been listening. and the place went nuts. And then the word got out and all the other kids, it had to be a thing, you had to go hear the Benny Goodman band so that it was great success. Swing was a phenomenon. And just the way the Beatles turned out to be a phenomenon, you know, 40 years later, 30 years later. It was 1935, America was still in the depths of depression and the world was waking up to the possibility of war. Against this unlikely backdrop, America's teenagers had found something to celebrate, an exciting new music they could call their own and dance to. A new sound in the night, a new kind of jazz, something called swing, and Benny Goodman is the king of it. It starts in the dance joints, jams the theaters, even raises the roof at classical Carnegie Hall. Now you have young teenagers who are able to, to, to embrace not only buying Benny Goodman records, but now they come out in droves to see him. It became a social thing to do as a part of your social life as a teenager. To, be, to, to go to dances, and you, that was part of the, the romantic scene and so forth. And uh, it was uh, part of the youth culture. First, the basis of every swing band is the rhythm section. Mass youth culture 
and American popular music exploded in the middle of the American Depression. Everyone wanted to know about swing. In Artie Shaw's rhythm section, we have drums, piano, guitar, and bass fiddle. You can hear the rhythm section through every swing tune. Now on top of this, an intricate melody. Artie Shaw and his famous clarinet. Then a saxophone section. Playing melody and harmony, and finally, a brass section of trombones and trumpets. For full coloring and a full band effect. And we've got swing that's really in the groove. White teenagers were driving the swing phenomenon and bands such as Artie Shaw's and Jimmy Dorsey's joined Benny Goodman on the radio, on record and on film. The dance always associated with swing, the Lindy Hop, crossed over to a white audience to become something else, the Jitterbug. Young white women hadn't been seen dancing like this before. Adult America, already suspicious of the music's African-American origins, was horrified. Swing was labeled as dangerous music that made you have sex. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, I think people are, are all interested in sex and danger to a certain extent, as long as no one gets hurt. And, you know, music's not really gonna hurt you, you're probably just gonna have a good time. Swing was more than music. For the teenagers embracing it, it offered a way of life. Music, a code of dress, even a language. It was the world's first youth culture. Swing music acts as a narcotic and makes them forget reality. It is like taking a drug. Swing music represents our aggression to our primitive tam tam tam. Dr. Brill's film went on to outline the dangers Swing presented to an average American diner. Any public gathering, having a wash, and worst of all, housework. Enjoying dancing was something that was really needed, especially in America, in the, that was in the depths of the Great Depression, when people were, were homeless and had no jobs. And, uh, and it was there that the, uh, the youth took on this new music that was coming out, and they, they embraced it wholeheartedly. So the band leaders were definitely the, the pop stars of the other time. The magazines devoted exclusively to what they're doing, what they're wearing, all that sort of thing. The mass audience that Benny Goodman brought to swing also benefited African-American bands. One of these turned out to be arguably the greatest swing band of all time, the Count Basie Orchestra. Casey was one of the best human beings I think I've ever met. What a, he was like an angel. Everybody loved Count Basie. You could never find anybody who ever said a bad word about him. Count Basie was a tough New Yorker stranded in Kansas City 
when the vaudeville show he was the pianist in ran out of money. The next really good kind of swing came from the Southwest. Kansas City, Oklahoma, Omaha even, and uh, it was a place in the Depression. The only place that didn't suffer from the Depression was Kansas City. Uh, Kansas City was run by Mayor Prendergast, and didn't matter in the teeth of the Depression, the worst kind, the town was wide open. It was run by the rackets. He played in a little club in Kansas City, and he knew everybody who came in the joint. And everybody who came in the club would uh, order a drink for Basie. So while they're playing, Basie takes a little vacation from them. Bleep, boom, he gets on the piano and says, hey, Joe, how you doing, man? He goes on to Joe's table and says, has a little drink because he knew he had one there. So he had a little drink with the Joe. Then he goes back to the, to the band, which is still going, bleep, 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 bleep. Then he saw, hey, Bill, what do you say, Bill? So he goes over to Bill's table and has a little taste with Bill. And he said, I got to get back. He goes, ba doom ba doom ba doom ba doom Then, oh, John comes in. Hey, John. And that's taking advantage of space. Part of Count Basie's music lay what was considered the best rhythm section in the business. Guitarist Freddie Green, drummer Joe Jones, and bass player Walter Page. Walter Page was a band leader of his own all through the 20s, and he was a bass player. He's the man who taught the whole Count Basie rhythm section how to play, to where you had a nice floating thing. But Basie was just playing chords here and there. Everybody's played down to the level of the bass, and that's what started the whole floating thing that was so wonderful about the Count Basie thing. With a rhythm section like that, you couldn't go wrong. It, it automatically says to you, this is the way to do it. And take advantage of this, you gotta listen to the chords and listen to the way the band swings. They really figured it out. And when they came to New York, then that's when they really turned everybody out, you know. Count Basie may well have languished in Kansas City if he hadn't traveled to New York to appear in one of the first ever major concerts to celebrate African-American music. In the renowned Carnegie Hall, the series of concerts were called Spirituals to Swing. These landmark concerts were a real eye-opener to New Yorkers who had never appreciated the full range of African-American music. They heard gospel, blues, and boogie-woogie, as well as Benny Goodman and Count Basie. Now, you took part, um, played piano, in one of the first jazz concerts of all time in Carnegie Hall, didn't you? That was the Benny Goodman concert. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Benny invited uh, about six of our group along, uh, for the jam session part of it. Mm -hmm. And it was truly a great thrill. Mm -hmm. That was a milestone in jazz history, really, wasn't it? Well, I think it's one of them, I would say. The arrival of Count Basie in New York 
marked a creative high point of the swing era and turned the city into the jazz and swing capital of the world. At this point, the music had matured. It had the improvisation of Louis Armstrong, the sophistication of Ellington, and the rhythm of Count Basie. Plus, a new generation of extraordinary vocalists was beginning to make their mark on the music. Singers had featured in big bands from the very earliest years, but most band leaders had dismissed them as an interruption of their music. By the 30s, this had all changed, with the arrival of some of the greatest singers of the 20th century, people such as Billie Holiday, Peggy Lee and Ella Fitzgerald. First of all, the singers, they were considered a necessary evil. The publishers demanded that the song have words and somebody sing them. So they always stuck them down in the second chorus of an arrangement. The, the singer would sing after the band played a chorus, and then the band would play out, you know, after that. So that the singers didn't usually even end the old records, if you remember. You know, all the Benny Goodman records with Helen Ward, they, they, they sang in the middle of the song, not, not at the beginning and the end. And the leaders didn't like singers, a lot of them. They only had singers because they had to have them. Now the singers were starting to generate as much publicity as the bands. I've got no lost man blues. He didn't treat me fair. It's more than I can bear. I've got no lost man blues. Billie Holiday had started as a jobbing singer with big band leaders Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman and Artie Shaw. But by 1939, she was packing black and white alike into a club called Caffey Society in New York's Greenwich Village. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And now I'd like to sing a tune. It was written especially for me. It's titled Strange Fruit. I do hope you like it. One of the high points of Billie Holiday's performance was when the lights dimmed, waiters stopped serving, and she slowed the swing down to sing Strange Fruit, a song about the horrors of lynching in the South. Bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves, and blood at the fruit. My aunt was a singer, Everybody and she played me singing. a record. And I didn't know what it was, but I said to my aunt, I want to sing like her. Strange fruit hanging there was a record by Billie Holiday of Strange Fruit. And when I heard that record, that changed my life. Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain together, for the wind. Initially, the record company she worked with refused to release such a sensitive song. When it was eventually released, Strange Fruit was banned by many radio stations in America and by the BBC in London. Billie Holiday was painfully aware of racial prejudice. She had felt it firsthand on joining Artie Shaw's band in 1938. She had just quit the Basie band, and that was a horror for her because they dressed her up as Aunt Jemima, and the band was wearing old field hand stuff. She didn't like that. And I said, it's time for you to get a job. She said, where is that? With me. She said, go away. I said, I'm telling you, 
So she said, what's it pay? I said, 60 bucks. That's what I get, what everybody gets a week. So she said, all right, I got nothing better to do. With Billy Holiday on board, Artie Shaw soon had a hit on his hands. I wrote the song, the words, and the arrangement because it, it, it felt like what Billy should sing. All through the years we'll stand together Sharing the tears and stormy weather And the sunshine Any Old Time was a big hit, but in America at this time, that wasn't enough to make her immune from prejudice, even in metropolitan, sophisticated New York City. To chase away the blue NBC presents the distinguished swing of Artie Shaw, King of the Clarinets, and his orchestra, creating dance history in the Blue Room of the Hotel Lincoln in New York City. Well, in the middle of all this, the woman who managed and ran the Hotel Lincoln came to me and she said, Artie, when the singers come in at night to change from the street clothes into their evening clothes, they go up in the elevator, and Billy goes up, and we have guests, and they take the same elevator, and they see a black, they see a colored lady in the elevator. And she said, it raises the dickens with us, because they come, a lot of people are from the South. And they come to the desk and say, what do you do? You take colored people in here? And the man has to explain that she's a singer with a band. She said, it causes tremendous problems for me. Would you ask Billy if she would mind going to her dressing room by the freight elevator? I said, Billy, I feel awful. I don't even like to ask you this. Do you want to do it or don't you? She said, no, I don't want to do it. I said, OK. She said, what I really want to do is get away from this world. Forced into using a service lift, Billy Holiday never went on the road with a swing band again. War song or no war song, from one end of the USA to another, Soldiers on leave and war workers find that America's musical home front is jumping. By the time the Second World War broke out, swing was so popular that the American establishment was forced to perform a spectacular U-turn and embrace the music it had previously viewed as decadent and immoral. Recognizing the historic fact that music helps to win wars, the Army and Navy are working with the nation's song publishers who are helping to meet the need for more and more music, both popular and classic. The war was good for the bands, basically, because you couldn't buy automobiles, you couldn't buy refrigerators, you couldn't buy clothes, anything, because all the stuff was going for war purposes. So there was a lot of money around, and you spend it buying records or going out to dances. And, and then the bands were being used to play for the troops. Famous jazz composers like the great Duke Ellington are turning out new works to fit the accelerated mood of a nation at war, but nevertheless determined to have its fun. Benny Goodman was deposed as the nation's favorite pop star by probably the most famous swing musician of all time. His sound would forever be associated with the Second World War. His name was Glenn Miller. Ask a young person, you know who Ray Anthony is? Uh, well, they don't have a clue. You know who Glenn Miller is? Oh well, yeah, I've heard that name before. It's a strange phenomenon. Before the war, Glenn Miller had been a trombonist and arranger whose big band hadn't been going all that well. He decided he needed a new and distinctive sound and adopted a sweeter, more romantic tone. It achieved almost instant success. It got bigger and bigger, and then it went back down to a smaller and smaller size. Benny Goodman had five brass. Glenn Miller was the first one to open it up to eight brass. So uh, with eight brass, you had to have more harmony within the uh, arrangement. Glenn Miller's sound was more organized with fewer solos. It was more soothing music, perfect for a country apprehensive about the onset of war. In 
1939, Time magazine noted that roughly a quarter of all discs in the nation's jukeboxes were Glenn Miller's. Miller's main pre-war hit, Tuxedo Junction, sold 115,000 copies in the first week alone. It was popular music, but it was very good popular music. And those arrangements are very interesting. They're put together in a very clever way with the, with the movement among the various instruments, among the various sections, going back and forth. Then, at the height of his popularity in 1942, Miller did an extraordinary thing. He disbanded his civilian band and decided to use his music to boost wartime morale. At 38, he was too old to enlist, but managed to persuade the army to take him on to lead a joint forces band. The saxophone section is presided over by that rather portly gentleman in the, near the center there. And he used to occupy that same position with Artie Shaw before Artie went in the Navy. His name is Sergeant Hank Freeman. He's in charge of the board. He transferred this 30-strong army and Air Force orchestra to London in 1944 to be as close as possible to the fighting troops. They gave over 800 performances to an estimated one million Allied servicemen and provided a powerful link to home and peace. By December 1944, he was a major and left for Paris intending to play for the soldiers who had recently liberated the city. He never got there. His plane disappeared over the channel. What happened remains a mystery, but it made him a national icon. I was on Midway Island when we heard of his uh, failure. Um, uh, and it was like a president of the United States dying. It was that strong. It was not just American troops who were inspired by swing. Much to the annoyance of the Nazi leadership, German troops were tuning their radios into it too. This led to one of the most bizarre episodes in the history of the music, Nazi swing. The Nazis had originally tried to outlaw swing as degenerate music, and their propaganda films emphasized that it was played by black people and spread by Jews. Swing is Trump. We are not in Africa, but in New York. Despite this, they found it impossible to ban, and like the Americans, decided to harness it for their own war efforts. Joseph Goebbels launched a swing counterattack. He put together a Nazi swing band called Charlie and His Orchestra, which made over 90 recordings between 1941 and 1943, mainly Nazi versions of American swing hits. You're Driving Me Crazy was a popular American swing tune of the 30s, here performed with its Nazi rewritten lyrics. Here is Winston Churchill's latest tearjerker. Yes, the Germans are driving me crazy. I thought I had brains, but they've shattered my planes. They've built up a front against me. It's quite amazing. Clouding the skies with their pain. The results were broadcast to Britain and the States. Rumor has it that Winston Churchill enjoyed them no end. It was fitting then that the Allies would celebrate winning the war at Hitler's old stomping ground, the Nuremberg Stadium, by playing host to Glenn Miller's band. Back in Britain, swing had had a huge impact and left an enduring legacy. The exotic American troops who had brought the music with them might have gone, but Britain's homegrown music scene had been electrified by swing.
We had Ted East Band, which was a great band. I played with him from 1945. The ensemble playing was excellent. Learned from uh, the Americans that, came, that we all listened to in the war. Glenn Miller's band and the uh, Ardishaw Navy band. They were hugely influential. We started in 1953 and did all the circuit in Britain. By the time it got to 1959, we were invited to the uh, Newport Jazz Festival where we were playing with everybody. It looked like a who's who of jazz. But we went on and played how we knew. And when the New York Times came out, they said that this English band is still using something which has virtually disappeared with, from many American bands, and that is the ability to swing. And that was the surprising truth, because while the Second World War was followed by a golden age for swing in the UK, in America its home, swing was sinking into decline. British swing had a big advantage because there was very little homegrown competition. In America, by contrast, there was lots of new music. Smaller bands were forging the way towards rock and roll. Big bands faced so much competition that they were finding it hard to survive. Even Duke Ellington had to subsidize his big band after the war with his recording royalties. I had so many expensive people in the band, and you know, it's the highest paid band in the world. I mean, the individuals are the highest paid, the men in the band, of course. They they get the money, I get the kicks. I wish I could afford this payroll. The rest of the big bands had to change their ways. It's a great sound, but that was an expensive sound, and the world just couldn't afford it in later years, after the 40s. So the bands had to downsize, even Lionel Hampton had to downsize. Peggy Lee had first recorded Why Don't You Do Right in 1942 with the full might of the Benny Goodman band behind her. When she recorded it again 10 years later, it was a very different story. She was backed by just four musicians. bands were giving way to more cost-effective small bands. These small combos were creating their own version of what a swinging big band was. But it didn't have to be uh, three trumpets and five tenors or saxophones. Uh, great pianists like Oscar Peterson, Errol Garner, they were like mini big bands. It was all in those fingers and an understanding between the bass player and the drummer and whatever feeling the individual had. Whole new styles were beginning to undermine swing. A small but intense minority of the industry's customers are real record fans. Many of them addicts of hot jazz in its more erudite forms, such as today's bebop. Bebop came 
came in, which was the Miles Davis and the Charlie Parker, they brought a music in. They didn't want you to dance to their music. They wanted you to listen to their music. So that was where you had to sit and listen. And they cut all, they cut the dancers out. They had signs up, no dancing, no dancing. And that, that damaged us. Taste had changed. These older people who had been the basic audience for the dance bands fell away. They, they, they couldn't go out dancing, they had families. Um, and the younger people coming along were interested in the, in the pop singers. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Frank Sinatra. What? <sighs> like most other singers at the time, Frank Sinatra had started out as a less significant element in big bands. But after the war, he was extraordinarily successful as a soloist. Now it was the swing singers people wanted to hear. I accompanied him on a couple of occasions and I saw something about this man of small build that was like powerful. You know, he just had this very um, magnetic personality and uh, people were just smitten with his whole outlook. And he broke it in little pieces. Now how do you do? Hey, you lie awake just singing the blues all night. Goody, goody. Frank Sinatra was one of the first singers to start employing the bands that had started off employing him. You had it coming to you. Goody, goody. There's nothing better happened to me than spending the years on the bus with the bands because you worked 365 days a year. And if you're going to be good in any job at all, I think if you eat, sleep, walk, talk, and dream it, you're going to be good at it. In the end, you'll be a, you'll be a big man in it. The singers were not that important part of a band. They were like they would sit there, like when I was with the Glenn Miller band. The Modern Airs were with the band, and uh, Marion uh, Hutton and Ray Everly. The the turning point came when Frank Sinatra. Uh, got so popular. Saturday night is the loneliest night of the week Cause that's the night that my sweetie and I used to dance cheek to cheek I don't mind Sunday night at all Cause that's the night friends come to call And Monday to Friday go fast and another week is fast. Mm, Saturday night is the loneliest night. In the 50s, the center of the swing universe moved from New York to California. Capitol Records in Los Angeles signed not only vocalists such as Sinatra, but brilliant arrangers such as Nelson Riddle, capable of reworking swing to suit solo singers. Look down. Look down the lonesome road before you travel on. Say they took the vocalist like a jewel and they Look put up. it in the proper setting. Look it up. would be as if I brought you a raw stone and I said to you, please s set this properly. That's what the arrangers do. And they all were products of the big band era as was my father, of course, but uh, they, I think that I always have referred to their time in the big bands, all the singers and the musicians in the big band era, as that was their uh, answer to no, no university training or anything. This was better than university, because I don't think the curriculum at university uh, would, was up to it, uh, what they needed to learn, as it were, and uh, most of them didn't have any money anyway. As well as backing this new generation of pop singers, big band music found a new home in Hollywood. Henry Mancini went from the Glenn Miller Band to the Pink Panther. Johnny Mandel went from the Basie Band to Hollywood movies, writing hits like Suicide is Painless and The Shadow of Your Smile. Visions of the things to be, the pains that are withheld for me. For the next 30 years, 
Probably the best and most original swing music was composed for film. So, it was no coincidence that the next big bang in the history of swing came from Hollywood in the shape of the 1989 rom-com When Harry Met Sally. The huge success of the film's swing soundtrack, sung by Harry Connick Jr., relaunched the music for a whole new generation which had never heard of Benny Goodman. In the 20 years since, Swing continues to exert an endless fascination for modern performers such as Michael Bublé and Jamie Cullum, and for Robbie Williams, whose 2001 Swing concert at the Albert Hall became one of Britain's 50 best-selling albums of all time, selling 7.5 million copies worldwide. Pearly white, just a jackknife, has on that Keith Bay, and he keeps it. Amazingly, swing has endured for nearly a hundred years. No other form of popular music has lasted anything like as long or can boast such a roll call of 20th century music greats. Don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing. And that's what it was. It was the beat. And, uh, Everything in life got to be, and that was, that's what swing is. Makes no difference if it's sweet or hot. Just give that rhythm every little thing you've got. It don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing. 